Alright, and so welcome back to some more Nawhol information. This is Nawhol's 102, I suppose. Uh -huh. We got some tips and tricks, like I said I would bring in the future. Uh, I'm just going to go through a laundry list of things that I can think of for Nawhols. Uh, it's by no means everything you can do with Nawhols, and I encourage you to comment any ideas you can come up with on your own. Nice. Because that would be... Great. It's a place of learning. I've learned a lot of tricks just on my own, but I've also learned a lot of things watching what other people do. So, it's always great to share what you know, see what you can learn from it. Agreed. So, what you'll notice first is we've changed up the deployment zone to be uh, one of the many different types of uh, battle scenarios where you have one quarter of the table, your opponent has another quarter, and the other two are neutral. Indeed. This isn't any one specific battle plan. There's a laundry There's a list lot of them. them that are just corners like this. Yeah. Now we should probably mention that it is nine inches back. Uh, yeah, nine inches from the center bubble. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the reason I set up that we set up deployment zones illustrated like this is just because I wanted to talk about a weakness that null holes have in general. And if you play against scaving, you can exploit this. Or if you play a scaving, you really want to be aware of this. Uh, quartered deployments like this, or even L-shaped deployments like Nidus Paz or Jaws of Galay. The new one from... New one, yeah. yeah. Those are battle plans that you typically place objectives and have deployment focused on the center of the board. And what that means is your gnaw holes will sometimes be placed, used turn one for their casting or teleports, and then walked away from and maybe never used again. Mm. And so you lose a lot of value in that teleporting and those bonuses to cast that you can somewhat start to rely on, especially against other heavy caster armies. And these kinds of deployments are really tricky for you to use. I typically find that because you can't place one here and get your pluses to cast, you end up doing the either two very defensive or a two defensive deployments, like I showed before with Roundstone Cache, mm -hmm. where you're just trying to keep as much surface area as open as you can for casting and still be able to teleport with it. But because you can't place it where you want to, I find that you might end up placing two gnaw holes on either end as far up as you can get terrain and the deployment allows, just to try and get casting as much as you can. Specifically for this deployment, just remember that this, long, this edge is longer than this edge which means the distance from here to the objective and therefore where fighting is probably going to be taking place is shorter. That's a really good point. So you definitely want to have a gnaw hole on this side anywhere along this part of the deployment line. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you place it here if terrain is pushing you out. Sometimes you place it here if you just need more bodies to fit here and because this is impassable, it can include you. Or sometimes you place it further in to push that plus to cast deeper out. It does, however, allow you to place gnaw holes if you can get away with just one in your deployment. You can place them very far in the corner where they won't affect you, but if there's an objective back here, then it's a lot more effort for your opponent to reach it, and it's still influencing an objective that might be here. That makes sense. You can also do the super aggressive gnaw hole deployment. What's this guy doing here? <laughs> where you place it just deep into your opponent's corner. Yeah. Doing that is super aggressive. Your opponent can obviously... <laughs> All right. <laughs> Got some favoritism by the camera, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can place a null hole deep in the corner like that. Obviously, your opponent can deploy on it and turn it off immediately. But because this is such a deep deployment and the objectives are so far oriented in the center, mm -hmm. it becomes detrimental at some point to keep units back. It's generally a tactic you can do against very low model count, low unit count armies, like a god model army, whether they have Glotkin, Archaeon, Marathi, and Cronspine lists. These kinds of lists that have low model count generally can't afford to leave something like that open, and if there's an objective in your opponent's territory like that, it's super valuable and can stretch them out without even needing to be teleported through. It can sit there all game, and if it's holding back your opponent's play, whether they can't be as aggressive, or they have to sacrifice a unit that they would otherwise not want to, it means that it's getting work done even regardless of whether you're using it. So that's just what I wanted to talk about here. Central deployment plans are generally weaker deployments for Skaven just because of their gnaw holes that they're reliant on being tough. 
All right, and so let's get into some tips and tricks then for the knot holes. Uh, the first one I'm gonna cover is the very clear one that I've talked about before, I've talked about in the previous video, we've heard talked about on the channel before, and that's you can just tow in a knot hole into your opponent's territory in order to score battle tactics that are in your opponent's terrain, or that are in your opponent's territory for that battle tactic, holding a terrain feature like that, or just placing it super aggressively such that you can teleport and end wholly within with something like your little 32 mil hero. He can right. jump through, end up here. That's great for battle tactics, but also is what enables Skaven to use grand strategies, like have more units in your opponent's deployment zone than they do at the end of the game. Right. That's a decent grand strat for Skaven, just because heroes that are supporting, sitting in the back all day, mm -hmm. turn four or five, can jump out of a gnaw hole and start working towards your battle tactic when they've run out of value elsewhere. Mm. You can even do that with a fairly aggressive one, like right here. You just have to jump out turn one and then the next turn they walk over. Right. It's just something to keep in mind. It enables grand strategies and battle tactics. The next thing we have are alpha strikes. So kind of touched upon this with aggressive gnaw holes in general. Gnaw holes, are very helpful for very aggressive battle plans or very aggressive strategies as long as they're not super aggressive but outside of that three inch range of your opponent's setup range right here or any further away just because it means you can teleport out even if they deploy in the line holy within six nine out is still going to be somewhere back here so you can still come out but if they don't deploy you can jump out further into their deployment and charge out from there you want super aggressive ones like this when you're alpha striking with typically giant rats, uh, rat ogres, the vermin lord deceiver with his six inch out teleport, thankwall, and laosha on the soul seeker. Uh, storm fiends can typically take advantage of this with their 12 inch range rattling guns. It's super important and for rattling guns in general. It's aggressive knot hole deployments like this enable you to jump clan rats through dump out your rattling guns and then shoot whatever's close by. Mm. With those close range shooting, that's kind of your only way to guarantee getting your 12 inch range guns into range top of turn one. And so you can place two gnaw holes super aggressive just to spread them thin and then have something like the deceiver who teleports anywhere outside of six, take advantage of the fact that they're stretch thinned and hit apart super hard unexpectedly. But it also just is generally what you want to do if you're building a list around very far aggressiveness. And to that end, gnaw holes are very helpful for gutter runners because gutter runners, when they deploy off the board, they have to show they have to show up on turn one, more than six inch, more than nine inches from an enemy, and wholly within six of terrain. Slink Skittershank and his crew, yep. uh, same thing, wholly within six of terrain, more than six from enemies. Yeah, but. What you can do is you can place your terrain anywhere on that edge of the board and guarantee yourself a spot for them to pop out. So if this terrain was too close, like right here, yeah. your opponent can preclude that nine inches from your six inch bubble and make it really difficult, especially if you have a 15 man gutter runner unit. But you can place knot holes here, not to mention you can place behind there, get some free defense because nothing can finish a charge on impassable. Indeed. So if they're shoved into a corner like this, the only thing that's going to get them is something going all the way around or shooting over. Indeed. Now, you you were talking about, put it here, They don't just to ex, ex, make sure everything's clear, mm -hmm. the gut runners and or slink skitter shanks crew do not have to come out outside of a gnaw hole. They just have to come outside of terrain, some yes. kind of terrain. But what you were talking about was if the, the terrain that's already on the board it sort of excludes you from doing that, mm -hmm. then you can... Uh, place your gnaw hole to yeah. To you always open have up a some new degree path. of control exactly. with your gnaw holes. Exactly. Yeah. Good point to clarify. Yeah. Thank you. So that's just another thing to remember. Gutter runners love gnaw holes, and you can do things like that. Uh, another tactic you can do is the classic. This was the Skaven 2.0 strategy when that book came out way back then. Uh huh. The Gracier or even any engineer, any caster, can do this. Uh, Thankwall can't because it has to be a teleport. Okay. The idea is someone who can be Skitterleet, Dreaded Skitterleet, 
uh, use any special enhancement like the far skitter cloak from the uh, what's it called the far skitter from the Ashen artifacts. Oh or right, yep. Any other unique enhancements like in the uh, season where you can teleport your Galatian champions. Yep. There's Those a, there's a new um, aspect of the champion that you can literally just teleport. Right? Yeah, it's a new unique enhancement mm -hmm. just for this season only. Cool. But in general, any teleports, namely uh, Skitter Leap is the mainstay. You can jump a casting hero, yep. teleport him wholly within six of a knot hole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he says when he teleports. Yeah. Um, <laughs> For real. Gracier can teleport whole youth in six of the gnaw hole. Uh -huh. Get nice and close to the enemy. Yep. Do something like dump a purple sun or set up a warp lightning vortex. Mm -hmm. Just right here. Obviously he's sticking his neck out, but then at the end of the movement phase, yep. you don't have to be able to move to jump. You just can't move. Exactly. He can't move because he's skitter leap, but he can still jump through. It's just at the end of the movement, he's within six, so conditions are met. He can just leave. Indeed. And jump back out. And that won't work for like a bell or something like that. And that's why Thankwall doesn't work because, yeah, a bell, Thankwall can't be teleported with Skitter Leap. There are too many wounds. Yeah. Yeah. If you could teleport them through any other method, oh, then that works. Man. Yeah. Oh, that's true. So like yeah. uh, Launchon. Laoshan does not work because Laoshan moves in the movement phase. Oh. And so it'll move you, but you've already missed your window to cast, right. dump out your endless spell, then jump right. through back. Which is why Thankwell can't do it. Got it. Okay. Uh, another nice thing about this is if you set up in range, you get zapped on the setup, but bef it also zaps at the end of the movement phase, but you can order your end of the movement phases as you want if it's your turn. So he can jump through, then you can zap. Okay. Yeah, then you can trigger the end of the movement uh, damage from the Warp Lightning Vortex. So just keep that in mind. You okay. don't have to get double tapped if you put him in range. So. It's not the end of the world if it push if the only way to get the vortex to fit yeah. is such that your grace here ends up in range. Sometimes that's fine because you're only going to get hit by one part. Right. And well, it, and and your your uh, it happens at the end of the movement phase, right? And on setup. Right. So oh, right. On Good setup, point. Yeah. And then you leave I was going to say because don't again. you get to choose? Right. Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Is yeah, you can avoid the second zap. Nice. By ordering it. Excellent. Uh, so for our next little trick. This is dependent on your local area, whether they use mystical terrain rules or not, <laughs> but it's a really simple one. Cool. If you have arcane terrain that's close enough to the board edge that you can set up a gnaw hole outside of three, obviously, because that's legal deployments, but keep it just within as close as possible. So if this is arcane, it has a one inch aura of plus one to cast on my dispel. Mm -hmm. And then you can also set up a gnaw hole within three so that a hero that sets up in that little one inch band is both touching the terrain and touching the gnaw hole and is now getting plus two to cast unbind and dispel. And this can go out as far as one inch here and on a 32 mil model can go as far out as about five inches, six inches or so. You can do something like this. Just to double dip for plus the casting, I especially like doing this on Thankwolf, so he's got plus five to cast and unbind. Good grief, yeah. And he's also on a longer base, so you can afford to be further away and still manage to double dip, like with a base about this Even size. as ridiculously small as his surfboard base is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got him right in the kill. Cover and to that there. end, if you can set up terrain, depending yeah. on the player's pack, if it lets you set up terrain, and then you roll randomly for Mystical terrain. Oh, if it's player set up terrain. You can yeah. sometimes set up terrain just so much. So edge. you can literally just so do that, that yourself. Yeah. yeah, and if you can and if you do it the way where you roll all the mystical dice, then the person places them and then uh -huh. you pick sides. Uh -huh. If you can place two, either one neutrally, or if you have two arcanes, one Got in both it. players' deployment That's a great near idea. the edge, then you can set yourself up for success that way. Absolutely. It's all about taking whatever advantage you can get because why not? Yeah, well, no, I mean, and that's normal. Like, that's why they do that in those player packs mm -hmm. is so you can prevent and set up situations for yourself. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, okay. So that's just a little mystical terrain tip there. The other, less of a hard tip and trick, but an idea that you can kind of use throughout when you see the option arise is null holes are impassable, which yeah. means if there's terrain that is set up, you know, protecting an objective back here, 
and you don't want their big monster, this is especially important for Mega Gargants or Sons uh -huh. of Bayamat, you can place Nawholes such that they can't finish a move over or finish a move on. Now they can, for example, Mega Gargants or anything that flies can move over both. But if you have a unit behind here, yeah. they can't finish on top of you and they can't finish on top of the terrain if it's impassable like right here. Indeed. And so you can kind of reduce surface area in that sense so, just by placing knot holes a little clever. So for example, if we took our little gutter runners here. It works better against the board edge too. Like I was kind of talking about this in between. Yeah, for sure. If you, ha if you set it up so it's a little bit further ahead, then they can't actually Something fit like through this. here. Because even if they want to get to say Thankwell, which is mm -hmm. what happened to me uh, last night, <laughs> put Thankwell here, and then they can't end up over top of this. So they can't charge over here. So they have to come through your screen over here. Uh, that works really well. Yep, you can also, this is kind of a sleazy tactic that you might not want to use sometimes. I don't think I use it either. But <laughs> to finish a charge, you need to finish within half an inch. Yes. If there's a wall thick uh, enough, I see what you you're can saying. set up yes. alongside where there's yeah. just enough of a gap with your screen that they can't finish the charge over top. Right. And so they're occluded from here, and this is impassable, so they can't end on top of that. So if you keep the screen going along here. Right. But the board edge is also another surefire way of doing well, it. And yes, I wouldn't, I don't do that either. It's, and even just like using terrain before was a big thing with giants, so they mm -hmm. couldn't end their terrain yeah. within uh, the distance. Um, but, you know, even if we don't choose to use it, like obviously that's up to the person whether yeah. they're going to use it. And for the people who are watching this video on what to do against Skaven, this is also something to kind of be aware of. Yes. Right? And yeah, another point to remember, giants can walk over, but they can't charge over or pile in over. Right. So it can still be valuable even if you're not doing that little tick. It's, it's like flying in 40k. Yeah, if you're just, you know, in this gap here yeah. and this is untouched, they can't charge over it unless they're going all the way up and over. They only can move over, so. It That's still nice. works for giants, but things that fly, not so much. Nice. Uh, that's kind of an idea. You can extrapolate that further, you know, combining terrain, especially if it's a player pack where players set up terrain and the other person chooses. You can do things knowing that you're going to place a knot hole somewhere and set up choke points like that. That makes sense. Okay. The last thing I have is just blocking opponent's terrain. This is a big dick move, <laughs> but I love doing it. <laughs> Now, big dick isn't good, or it's kind of a just a dick move. It's a dick move. Okay, <laughs> but it can also be. Like, I don't big know, dick move maybe. sounds kind of good, right? You're just like, yeah. I'm just sure, yeah. True. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Uh, for opposing terrain faction terrain, particularly ones that are really large, like the Bone Tithe Nexus yeah. or the Seraphon Pyramid, whatever Realm Shaper engine. Yeah. They can end up having trouble fitting in certain deployments or territories, things right. like Realmstone Cache or a terrain dense board. Got it. They can end up like maybe they'll only have one or two spots. What you can do with knot holes, because they're the only terrain piece that can be placed anywhere on the board edge yep. outside of your territory. All others have to be, you know, within a territory. Mm -hmm. You can plug one spot where they can fit that terrain feature. So for example, we go here. We go here, so it could maybe fit on this side or that side. You place a knot hole such that they won't be able to fit it on they that side. They can't put it where they want yeah. to, they have to put it. Now it has to go here. Fits. Yeah. Now do keep in mind yes. that if there was only one spot, like say for instance, this was here, and so the only spot they can fit it is right here. And then you put your knot hole. Never put never a knot hole yeah. in that spot. Yeah. Because the rules for really big terrain pieces the Realm Shaper Engine and the Bone Tithe Nexus are the only real ones, I believe, that do this. Yeah. Are if you can't place it at all, I think the you're allowed to. One too. Maybe, yeah. yeah. But you can split it, so maybe not. Uh -huh. I'm not sure. But if they can't place it, they're allowed to remove a terrain piece, and that includes your own knot holes. So if you plug up all the spots, then it'll go there. You can only funnel a spot like that. Now, if it's something really small, like a corn altar, yeah. and somehow there's only one spot in yeah. some <laughs> weird setup, then feel free to do it, because then you oh, can just stop man. them from doing it altogether. That is pretty uh, shifty. Because it's only the really large terrain pieces that will let you pick up a piece and then place it. Right. That's going to be all that I've thought of, right. if there's any more. 
I might go to the comment section and add something myself, or Rob might do it. Yeah. But, but if feel you free have to put yours that I down. Said, Indeed. Please let us know. This is all a space to share this knowledge, and I hope you've learned something from all this and might enjoy squishing the many man things and lizard things and all the opponents of the Skaven. Yep. Right where they belong. It's true. <laughs> they do belong there. Or if you're watching this video to get tips and tricks against the Skaven, then. Don't pay attention. Just forget everything just, you just learned. Don't say it was from this video so I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, tell everybody. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much to Matthias for coming out and giving all sorts of great tips and tricks. And Absolutely. Yeah, and we'll see you guys next time. Yeah.